Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here on the sixth anniversary uh, of the shooting at my high school, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the city of Parkland. Um, I want to thank my colleagues for being uh, with me here, uh, Whip Catherine Clark, who just toured uh, the building, uh, which is a time capsule of where the shooting was with me a couple weeks ago, Mike Thompson, who is chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, Maxwell Frost, of course, who was part of March, uh, March of Our Lives, Dan Goldman, who was the vice chair of the task force, and obviously Congresswoman Lucy McBeth, whose life was uh, touched by gun violence. Um, um, you know, it, it, it feels like just yesterday uh, the shooting happened at the, my high school. I remember getting there a couple hours after the shooting and just it, it looked like I had a scene in like, out of like a movie. Um, the FBI, all the emergency equipment, the mass casualty units, um, and then being with the families – uh, who lost loved ones, the parents who were finding out what happened to their kids, what floor they were on in the building of the kids that were missing. You know, I knew, I knew they weren't missing. The weeks of funerals, you know, driving past one funeral to go to another funeral, and, and every family said the same thing as they eulogized uh, their kids or their loved ones. And they said, all I did wrong was send my kid to school. Um, and... I knew those parents did nothing wrong. I knew that was an indictment on the elected officials who had allowed what happened at Douglas to happen by not dealing with the fact that mentally ill people can have access to weapons uh, and that Florida had, was known as the gunshine state um, and that we hadn't done anything on school safety. Uh, and so, you know, three weeks after the, the events at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, we passed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School Safety Act, which put hundreds of millions of dollars into school safety, mental health, school resource officers in every school. We uh, raised the age to buy a gun in Florida to 21, three-day waiting periods, red flag laws, which, by the way, have been used 12,000 times in the state of Florida since we put those in place six years ago. 12,000 times law enforcement has determined that someone is either a danger to themselves or a danger uh, to others. Uh, and has taken away uh, their weapons. I mean, think about what we have stopped from happening just by red flag laws uh, themselves. Uh, and so, look, I, I, I came up here to work on this issue. I've been here a year. Some of the folks behind me have been here longer and have been working at this issue every single solitary day. And, you know, in the 117th Congress, finally broke the logjam of passing a gun violence prevention uh, bill here. Um, and I think it was 30 years getting it done in Washington. It was the same thing in Tallahassee. We hadn't passed one in 30 years. But why does it take a Parkland or a Uvalde or, quite frankly, when gun violence affects an individual family? Why, why do we need these mass events to, to get our attention? I used to I, – I, I said in my speech on the floor six years ago, you know, the slow drip of kids getting killed in their neighborhood should be no difference. Uh, it should be no different. Um, but, but, you know, with that, I, I want to turn it over to, to Whip Clark, who just, with, just came to the city of Parkland and toured, uh, toured the building, and I'm, and I'm sure she'll talk about that. The building is exactly as it was the day of the shooting, minus the victims, of course. But everything else is there. The writing on the board, the homework on the desk, the computers, the essays that were being written. Um, and within the horrors of those walls are lessons for us to do, not just – on gun violence prevention, but on school safety. Yeah, how you install a door matters. How you put in a window matters. How, how you te train your teachers matters. All of these things matters. And there are, there are bipartisan things we could do here if this Congress can just figure out how to function. Uh, and so with that, I want to turn it over to Whip Clark. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to thank um, Congressman Moskowitz for his leadership, for his compassion. Um, and for his courage. And I want to thank the other leaders that are assembled here, Chair Thompson, Vice Chairs Frost, Goldman. We're glad to be joined by Josh Gottheimer and um, Sean Kasten, and a special thanks to Vice Chair Lucy McBath, who lives these values every single day. Simply said, things don't have to be this way. America's gun crisis is not inevitable. The slaughtering of children in their classrooms is not preordained. It is a choice. It is a choice that we have made. And I am so grateful 
to Congressman Moskowitz, who has been a voice and a champion for the Parkland community, for the memory of those murdered, for the parents and siblings and friends who are left behind, and for the innocent lives that we can still save. As he noted, last month he hosted me for a visit to his alma mater, and walking through the halls of Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, everything is just as it was six years ago on Valentine's Day. It is a place frozen in time, and so is Capitol Hill. Our gun laws are frozen in the past. It's as if nothing has happened, as if 23 children aren't shot every single day, as if guns aren't the single deadliest killer of American children. Congress had the power to keep an AR-15 out of the hands of an angry, unstable teenager. Congress had the power to save 17 innocent lives, and Republicans stood in the way because their perverse idea of freedom is unfettered access to weapons of war. But there is no freedom in violence and terror and death. There is no freedom from grief for a parent mourning their child's murder. And it is not too late for us to prevent the next tragedy. So it is my privilege to yield to a colleague who is fighting every day for a future that is free from the terror of gun violence. Our champion of common sense, the chair of our gun violence prevention task force, Congressman Mike Thompson. Thank you uh, very much for the gracious introduction. Uh, Congressman Motswitz, thank you very much for uh, bringing us together today. And uh, we all share in what you're going through and what your district and your constituents and your families are going through. And, and thank you to all my colleagues who are here today. Every one of these individuals is laser focused on making our community safer. Every one of them works every day figuring out how we can advance gun violence prevention legislation and policy to make a difference in our districts and every district across the country. Today, when the previous two speakers were at the podium, I couldn't help but think of three things. One, I hear every weekend when I go home from a student who says, we're afraid that our school's going to be next. Every weekend when I go home, I hear from a parent who says, I'm afraid to send my child to school. Just think of, even if a tragedy doesn't happen, the toll that takes on the family and on the individual, it's absolutely devastating. And lastly, what I think about is the fact that the only place in America where gun violence prevention is a partisan issue is in this building, in the United States Congress, and it's because the the other side of the aisle lacks the guts to do anything. As has been said, there are many things that we can do. All it takes is a, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to step up and do it. There are a number of discharge petitions on the floor right now that Democrats have put forward and signed, every one of which will make our community safer. Not one Republican has signed a single one of those petitions. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep pushing this forward. We're going to do everything we can to make it happen, but it's going to, it's going to require that the Republicans step up. It's not a partisan issue. This is about protecting the people that we were sent up here uh, to represent. And someone who understands that and has done great work, it's an honor for me to work with him, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce him today, and that's Congressman Maxwell. Um, uh, Frost, who's uh, the, the author of the bill that led to the White House having an Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Great work, and they're doing good work over there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much to uh, uh, Congressman Moskowitz for bringing us together. Um, I stand before you as a Floridian that got involved in politics in the first place at the age of 15 because I didn't want to get shot in school. I stand before you as a 27-year-old member of Congress who's kind of just thrown away uh, this last part of my 20s <laughs> because I don't want others to get shot in school either. You know, I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, a story of America was just this morning. Um, standing out front, I delivered remarks with some, some of the family members who had lost loved ones at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and other places. And these parents are desperate for action on this issue. Um, after these shootings, there's a lot of people who have voices in the halls of Congress. There'll be family members, advocates, members, NRA with their bags of blood money. But the people who don't have a voice in these halls are oftentimes the ones who were killed because they're dead. And I stood in front of families this morning who have used technology to create a voice message from their dead children that will be sent to members of Congress today and over the next several months. It's uncomfortable. It's disturbing. But what's more uncomfortable and disturbing is the fact that their kids died in a pool of their own blood on the floor of their school. And we have to honor their lives with action. And so today, um, to honor those 17 lives lost in Parkland and all the lives lost due to gun violence, um, I'm proud to be introducing a bill alongside with my friend, uh, Jared Moskowitz, called the Identify Gun Stores Act. This bill is simple. It prevents states from being able to prohibit credit card companies from establishing and implementing the potentially life-saving merchant category code to tr codes to attract suspicious gun and ammunition purchases. Uh, this is especially personal things that could have prevented what, what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and also what happened at Pulse nightclub where a uh, domestic terrorist armed bigot walked into Pulse nightclub and murdered 49 angels due to armed bigotry in eight. The Pulse nightclub shooter racked up more than $26,000 in credit card charges on guns and ammunition in the 12 days ahead of his killing spree. And before he did that, the shooter ran several online searches to determine whether or not the unusual spending would get flagged by credit card companies or not. And obviously it wasn't. And 49 people are dead because of that. And so I'm here alongside uh, these amazing allies and people fighting for a world where the leading cause of death for children and kids isn't to be shot. Um, and so we will continue to fight for get together uh, um, for the 17 lives lost and for a world where people don't have to fear gun violence. You know, our colleagues talk a lot about freedom and patriotism. I like to say patriotism is more than beer, bald eagle, and flag. It's about loving the people in the country. And I don't know about you, but when you love somebody, you don't want them to get shot. And with that, I'll yield to uh, Representative Dan Goldman. <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman Frost, um, for your moving words. Thank you, Congressman Moskowitz, uh, for, for leading us here today. I joined Congressman Moskowitz in November to, do, to take a tour of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me so much um, was the sheer arbitrariness and randomness of the people who died because of the way that the windows and doors were structured, the gunman never went into a classroom, just went down the hall, fired through the windows, and whatever was in his, uh, the, the angle that the gun could go through the windows was the target. Um, and so when Congressman Moskowitz talks about there are basic things that we can do to beef up school safety, which money went to in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, that is certainly one part of, uh, one way of doing it. Of, of reducing violence. The reality is that gun violence is the leading cause of death for children in this country. Cars have gotten safer and guns have not. And I am a parent of five kids. I have a first grader and a kindergartner who both have gone through active shooter drills in their schools when they barely know how a gun works or what even a gun is. I used to have fire drills. Now our children have active shooter drills to be taught what to do if 
a mass shooter comes into their school. It does not have to be this way. And I, for one, am sick and tired of hearing from my Republican colleagues about their thoughts and prayers and being chastised for making this a political issue after every single mass shooting. Well, you want to know what? It is a political issue. It is a political issue because even though there is overwhelming support for so many different gun safety laws, the Republicans in this body will not support things that the American public supports. There's no other issue where you have 85 percent of Americans supporting an issue and Congress doesn't take action. Eighty five percent of Americans support universal background checks. And so I'm very happy to be up here with these allies fighting for gun safety legislation. None of the bills that Chairman Thompson has talked about that are on the floor for discharge petitions would take people's right to own a pistol or a hunting rifle away from them. The only thing they do is they would restrict the types of weapons, such as semi-automatic assault weapons, which have no place in anything other than a war zone, and it would restrict the uh, limitations on how you get those guns so we can avoid mass shootings. And I think the work that Congressman Moskowitz did in Florida to pass red flag laws in a red state that remains on the books, that the Republican governor still supports because it has worked 12,000 times. And Congressman Moskowitz will tell you how all the sheriffs in Florida are grateful for it. That is an example of a basic common sense gun safety law that saves lives. And so we are not going to stop raising this issue, putting the pressure on Republicans. And I am happy to sit here and say this is a political issue. This is absolutely a political issue. And if you are going to choose the gun lobby over our children, you should be held to account. Thank you, and I'll yield back to Congressman Moskowitz. And any, any of my colleagues want to speak? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my sole purpose for being here today is to support uh, my colleague Jared Moskowitz and all of the phenomenal gun sense champions that stand be behind me. And I'm just so grateful for the infusion of new voices. But I'm also very sad for the infusion of these new voices here in Congress because it means that we are still so far away from solving this public health crisis. My son Jordan, his 29th birthday will be this Friday. And these are now years that I continue to fight on this hill and continue to lift the voices of so many people, so many children like my son Jordan that are unable to live in the fullness of the way that they were intended to live because they're no longer here. Today is Valentine's Day. And I listen to all the parents sending candy and flowers to their children. And all the children giving love to their parents. Happy Valentine's Day, Mom. I love you. I don't get to hear those words. I don't get to hear that from my son because he's not here. Because my son was murdered just as those children were murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And so I stand with every parent in this country that will not hear those words from the children that they lost because they were murdered unnecessarily due to this extremist gun culture that we have. For every parent in this country that will not hear their child say, I love you, Mom. Happy Valentine's Day. That is why we're here. And that is the reason why we are not going to give up. Happy Valentine's Day to all the mothers and all the parents that no longer have their children to give them love and affection on this day. I'm so grateful to my colleagues 
I'm so grateful to the new voices that stand here and help uplift and support this crisis that we live with every single day. We will not back down. And I'm so grateful that others are standing up. Let me likewise thank all of my colleagues that are here uh, and indicate that the journey seems to be long. I thank you, Congressman. I thank you all. Because I was here for Columbine when we put together a task force to ban the assault weapons. Columbine in the 1990s, when no one could understand how a high school shooting could take place with a long gun taken to the classrooms. And so I have over the years hugged mothers, hugged fathers and teachers. So it is very important as I serve as a ranking member of the crime subcommittee that over the years of all the legislation sponsored, that the main thing I offer today is that we will never give up the fight. I joined President Biden as one of the first or the first member of Congress to go to Ivaldi in my state of Texas to see those families, but more importantly, if you could ever see classmates crying, nine-year-olds, after the murder of their fellow students. Everywhere we go, we see that gun violence has torn people apart, torn families, torn teachers, torn communities. And yet we have the majority of this nation, as we have always had, and we cannot stand tall. Thank you for the gun violence office. And it is my commitment to join you on your legislation. But more importantly, I believe that we need to start our caravan across this nation and to be in the districts of those members who stand steadfast against common sense gun legislation against universal background check, against gun storage. We need to caravan and have the families of those blistering from the violence. And even this past week, a place of worship in my community saw a long gun, not walking on its own, but be carried in. Who knows what the level of disturbance of the person, but they were able to access a long gun because Texas has no red flag law. And the long list of concerns never seemed to have impacted the huge amount of bounty of weapons that this person had and unfortunately carried a little child with them. And so I will accept the challenge today of standing with these families and as well telling them again, don't let this sound as if it is one repetitive statement after another. Know that this comes from our heart. We will never have you stand alone. And we're going to finish this job. And we're going to make whole the brokenness or work to make whole the brokenness of your life because of the bloodshed that you've experienced. A caravan across this nation to demand these members who stand for nothing to stand for something to help us fight gun violence and help us win. Sheila Jackson Lee. So we'll be brief. Sean Caston from Chicago. This is the this is Valentine's Day. It's the sixth anniversary of the Parkland shooting. And six years and one day ago, I was at a candlelight vigil at Northern Illinois University because it is also the 10th anniversary, was the 10th anniversary, now the 16th anniversary of the mass shooting at Northern Illinois University. Valentine's Day means something different in Parkland, Florida and in DeKalb, Illinois than it means here. In the same way that July 4th means something different in Highland Park, Illinois than it might than what we might like to celebrate. But Valentine's Day is also the day in Chicago of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, 
when two gangs fighting over blood turf got in a gunfight, one gang shot the other gang, and we decided that it was so bad that these gangs were shooting each other that we banned the weapons they used. That led to the passage of the National Firearms Act that made Tommy guns illegal. How have we become a world where once upon a time in this country, we thought it was so bad when gang members got shot that we should ban the weapons that they used? And now we shoot kids and don't even care. I'm not saying we don't care here, but we have colleagues who wear AR-15 pins on their lapels like they're some cosplaying tough guy instead of making sure that kids don't get shot. It should be a day of love. It shouldn't be a day of blood. But it is until we do something about it. So I'm grateful to Congressman Moskowitz for his leadership, for all of my fellow champions who are up here. And my God, I want to stop having these press conferences. Thank you. No, thank you, Sean. I appreciate you coming. appreciate all of the members coming. I was listening to Lucy Macbeth, just thinking to myself, um, Lucy, like many of the parents in Parkland who lost their kids or lost their spouse, lost a family member, ran for office, whether it's Congress or school board or have not run for office. They've crisscrossed the country trying to make sure other families don't get drafted into this horrible, exclusive club that no one wants to be a part of, which is burying your family member because they were lost to gun violence uh, in their community. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, no, so the, we, we just introduced that bill, but part of one of the reasons why I've brought my Republican colleagues, quite frankly, also through the building uh, is because I do think there are areas that we can work together, especially on school safety, which is why I started the school safety uh, caucus uh, task force with uh, Representative Gonzalez from who is community experience uh, Uvalde, because there are things I think we can be doing. It's all about mitigation. Look, we could pass all the laws we want in the world, right? crime is still going to happen. But it's about mitigating. It's about decreasing. Okay, maybe it's not 17. Maybe it's four. Okay, well, you know, that's that's 13 more families that didn't have to go through that experience. So, you know, there are – if we could figure out how Congress can work to work at all, by the way, then maybe we could figure out ways we can come together uh, on school safety or even, like I said, on red flag laws, uh, which, you know, don't doesn't, – doesn't inhibit anyone's Second Amendment right. Uh, unless, of course, you're mentally ill and you want to harm other people, right? That, that should be something we can all agree on. Thank you. Go ahead. You were able to pass that legislation in Tallahassee. Uh, I mean, can you reflect on it? Is it harder at the congressional level? Because it's very hard in Tallahassee to get something like that done. Is it harder here in what makes it harder? Sure. So, you know, it's funny. People look back at that and they're like, how did, you, how did that happen? How, how did you get what people would consider some of the largest – gun violence prevention laws passed in the country in Florida, which, you know, was a gun chi- gunshine state. It had Marion Hammer, who was the strongest NRA lobbyist, you know, staying your ground. We were the Petri dish for, for, for all of that. And there were a lot of reasons it happened, the parents, the students. But quite frankly, it, it, it was myself and my Republican colleagues across the aisle just deciding to be parents, come see the school, Put politics aside. Understand there's areas we're not going to agree on, but don't let the enemy of the per- don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Right? I, I wanted to ban AR-15s. I wasn't going to get that done. Well, should I have blown the whole thing up? No, right? Because I looked at it being a former some former emergency management director now, but I was in the emergency management business at the time. I knew anything we did would save a life. Right? Every little piece of that puzzle that became the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School Safety Act would save a life. And so, um, it, look, it took my Republican colleagues stepping up to the plate. I was in the minority as a Democrat. And so I, I continue to give them credit. I give the Speaker credit, the Senate President credit, and Rick Scott credit. They did, they did the right thing, and history has shown they did the right thing. And there are no protests in Florida that you can't buy a gun when you want to buy a gun. So we didn't affect anyone's Second Amendment rights, and yet we're keeping people safe in school or in the grocery store or in the movie theater, much safer than we were than before February 14th. So Florida is a model, in my opinion, for the rest of the country and how you can get it done. And six years later, with a new governor, right, who said he didn't support the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School Safety Act, six years later, that bill is still completely intact, and they've only strengthened the school safety components on a bipartisan basis. And yes – Coming up here is much harder. 
Is it much harder on, on, on gun violence prevention? Sure it is. But it's much harder to do anything here. Right? Let's not pretend this is the most productive Congress of all time and we just can't get done gun violence prevention. Right? These guys can't even decide who they want to be their speaker. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming.